Lord willing, tonight I'll be speaking from the last of Acts chapter 4 where Joseph was surnamed Barnabas. There was something about this man that the apostles wanted to give him a different name. And that's what I'm going to preach on, surnamed by the apostles. I've entitled this message, Blessed. There is not a a week that goes by, almost not a day that goes by when I'm out in public that somebody says, have a blessed day. Do you hear that? Have a blessed day. And I realize they mean well when they say that. I guess it's the same thing as saying have a good day. I say that to people all the time. I don't know what it means, but I say it all the time. But being blessed is having the favor of God. No son or daughter of Adam can confer that. Only God can. To be blessed of God. And right now, as I'm speaking... Everybody in this room, we are either under God's blessing or we are under God's curse. There's no in-between. We either have God's blessing or we're under his curse. Turn to Matthew 25 for just a moment. Verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. Verse 41. Then shall he say, Also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed. Now here we have it. The sheep, blessing. The goats, cursed. Now if I have God's blessing, what that means is the infinite omnipotent God of glory is for me. If God be for us, who can be against us? To be blessed of God is to have God for you. And what power he has to bless And to be under the curse of God is to have God against you. It's true. If God be for us, who can be against us? But if God be against us, who can be for us? If I'm under God's curse, that means in the end I will be cursed. And when I'm sent to hell because of my sin, if I'm under God's curse, and I'm sent to hell because of my sin, all of God's creation will clap their hands, magnifying His justice for sending such a one to hell. God's blessing and God's 
curse. And let me also say this about God's blessing. Outward appearance and outward circumstance do not have anything to do with one having God's blessing for one having God's curse. You can't tell by outward circumstance. Now, we have so many examples of this in Scripture. The rich man and Lazarus. The rich man fared sumptuously every day. He had it made. Had a good life. Lazarus sat at the rich man's door full of sores. The dogs come licking his sores, dependent upon any crumbs the rich man would send his way. Who would the world say is blessed? They'd say the rich man, wouldn't they? He's blessed of God. Who would they say is not blessed? Well, Lazarus is not. Yet who was blessed? Lazarus was. Who was under God's curse? The rich man. I think of Job and his three friends. Job scraping his boils with potsherds. He was sick. He lost everything. And his three buddies were saying, what did you do that brought this all on you? You've committed some kind of sin to cause all this. And Job defending himself. Which one was under God's blessing? Job, who had everything stripped away. Who was under God's curse? These men making these accusations against Job. Now to have the divine favor, to have God's blessing. I think of Jacob when he's wrestling with that angel. And the angel defeats him. It's the Lord Jesus Christ he was wrestling with. He put his hip out of joint and he walked with a limp the rest of his life. That's an example of God's blessing. But you know what he said to that angel that he could not possibly defeat? Who brought him down? I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. I must have his blessing. Oh, I must have your blessing. I won't let you go, except you bless me. That's when God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. A prince with God. And what about his brother? Esau. He would trade the birthright. The blessing. For a bowl of soup. That's how meaningless it was to him. He just, it just was not really critical for him to have God's blessing. Oh, I think of our Lord lifting up his hands and blessing. And don't you want God to bless you? Oh, I want him to bless me. Listen to these scriptures. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Listen to this from Psalm 65. David gloried in election. Blessed is he whom thou choosest and causes to approach unto thee. Oh, what blessedness. And then we read of those of whom it said, Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. In due time their foot shall slide. Thou shalt despise their image. Here we have people under God's blessing. And here we have people under God's curse. Now when we read of the Lord blessing his disciples in our text, he led them out. I was thinking, I want to be somebody he leads out, don't you? I want him to just lead me. He led them out as far as Bethany. Bethany is where Martha and Mary and Lazarus lived. It's the place where Simon the leper lived. And the just a couple of miles from Jerusalem. But the name Bethany means house of affliction. And the Lord is left to the house of affliction, being raised from the dead. And he leads them out, and this is where he's going to ascend. They're going to watch him rise up into heaven. 
We're going to think about that, Lord willing, next week, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they watched him rise up to heaven. But while he was with them, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Now, I've talked about blessing and curse. The only way that you and I can be blessed is if there is no reason for a curse. Now, let me repeat that. The only way you and I can be blessed is if there is no reason for a curse. And that is precisely what the Lord Jesus Christ did on Calvary's tree. He removed the reason for the curse. My sin was removed. Now, you see, if I go to hell, if I'm under God's curse, there's one reason, my sin. My sin. And it's all my fault. My sin. I can't blame God. I can't blame providence. My sin is all my fault. And if God curses me, I will be getting exactly, precisely what I deserve. And on Judgment Day, the angels and all the church of God, if I'm cursed, they're going to praise God for my destruction. Holy and righteous and just are all His ways. I'll be getting exactly what I deserve. And the only way I can be blessed is if the reason for the curse has been removed. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did on Calvary's tree. He removed the reason for me to be cursed because he took away my sin. He put it away. He caused it to not be. And there is now no reason to curse me. There's nothing for me but blessing because of what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished for me. Now, don't you want to be one of those ones who he blesses? Oh, I want his blessing. I want him to have favor toward me. I want him to do something for me. I want him to look in mercy on me. I want him to see Christ and me in Christ. Now, these blessings, or shall I say this blessing, because all blessings come from the one blessing. This blessing that I'm talking about. The Lord reached up his hand and he blessed them. This blessing is eternal. Eternal. You know what that means? God's blessing is not God's response to you. These blessings, this blessing is eternal. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Every blessing I have was given to me before time began. And that shows how this blessing is not God's response to me. Well, if you do this, God will bless you. Tithe and God will bless you. If you give, he'll give to you. If you be nice to other people, he'll be nice to you. He'll be kind to you. Uh, that whole kind of thinking. Now, I'm, I'm not advocating, don't be kind, don't give. I'm not, of course. But if that's the way you think about God's blessing, you believe in salvation by works. You believe the blessings you have is God's response to something you've done. No, no, God's blessings are eternal. 2 Timothy 1.9, he saved us. And he called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Their purposed blessings, blessings given to us before we had any works, good or bad. To affect God's reason for giving. I love the scripture, Romans 9, 11 for the children. Talking about Jacob and Esau. God's elect, those who are not elect. For the children, being not yet born. Neither having done any good or evil. Your evil can't disqualify you. Your good can't recommend you. Do you hear that? 
for the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works. Not of works. Is that a blessing to you? If you're nothing but a sinner, this is a blessing to you. You're glad it's this way. If you're a self-righteous person, you don't like this because it's taking away what you're hoping in your works. But if you're a sinner, you love this. The blessing of God is a blessing of grace. That means nobody need to despair of having this blessing. You can be blessed by God. You can have God's favor because His Favor, his blessing is utterly of grace. Now turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. How many? All. In heavenly places, in the heavenlies, in Christ. Now, the blessing of God is complete. That means there's nothing that can be added to it. If God has blessed you, You cannot be any more blessed than you are. He's given us all spiritual blessings. Now, I know the world just thinks of temporal blessings. Oh, you're blessed if you have plenty of money and you don't have any trouble. No, it could be you're under the curse of God. Temporal blessings may be uh, adversity. Maybe you don't have anything. But what's more important, temporal blessings or spiritual blessings? I mean, I don't know temporal. I'm, I'm, listen to me. I'm, I'm happy to be able to pay my bills. I'm happy I have a car right now that I'm not always worried it's going to break down. I mean, there's, there's, I'm, I'm thankful for that kind of stuff. I'm not discounting it. But, but what is that in comparison to spiritual blessings? Having the love of God. Having the grace of God, having everything working together for your good and His glory. Having your sins put away. Being accepted in the Beloved. Listen to these spiritual blessings. Verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. There's the first spiritual blessing. Election. Being chosen. By God, in Him, before time began. Why me? Why would He choose me? Tis not that I did choose thee, for the Lord that could not be. This heart would still refuse thee, hadst thou not chosen me. What a blessing to be chosen of God. For what? That we should be holy. And without blame before him. Now, if God elected me and God blessed me, you know what that means? That means I'm holy. You mean you will be holy? No, I am holy. Right now, when God sees me, he sees holiness. Because I'm in Christ. I am holy. Somebody says, that's positionally. You know, I don't like that uh, language, positionally. That, that, just, that just reeks of, uh, no, I'm, I'm not holy position. I'm holy. <laughs> And without blame, nothing to blame me for. You see, all my sins have been put away. And I am perfect in Christ Jesus, without blame. Let's go on reading. In love, having predestinated us. In love, means God loves me. He predestinated me. You believe in predestination? Of course I do. Of course I do. You can't believe in the God of the Bible and not believe predestination. If you don't believe in the God of predestination, like I said a couple of weeks ago, the God you believe in does not exist. The God of predestination is the God who is God. And really, predestination, uh, 
You can't separate it from the cross. You don't really understand the cross if you don't understand the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Oh, how we love the God of predestination. What a glorious thing it is to be predestined by God to be adopted. Look what it says. Verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. I'm his, I'm his child by adoption. He adopted me. He picked me out. That's what that means. And I'm his child by birth. He birthed me into the kingdom of heaven. According to, verse 5, the good pleasure of his will. Why did God predestinate you to be his adopted child? Because he willed to do it. No other reason is needed. I, I, I love the way God's will is just supreme. He has no law over his head. He has no one he answers to. When he wills it, it's absolutely supreme. Because he willed it. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Now let me stop for just a moment. Is your salvation to the praise of the glory of his grace? Or is it to the praise of the glory of your will? One of the two. One of the two. Oh, it's to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And that word accepted, he has graced us in the beloved. In the beloved, accepted am I. Ascended, risen, ascended, and seated on high. Saved from all sin through his infinite grace. With the redeemed ones accorded a place. In the beloved, how safe my retreat. In the beloved, accounted complete. Who can condemn me? In him I am free. Savior and keeper forever is he. In the beloved, I went to the tree. There in his person by faith I may see. Infinite wrath rolling over his head. Infinite grace, for he died in my stead. In the beloved, God's marvelous grace calls me to dwell in this wonderful place. God sees my Savior, then He sees me. In the Beloved, accepted and free. Now, how accepted is Jesus Christ? How lovely is He to the Father? That's how accepted every believer is. Accepted in the Beloved. Now, these are these spiritual blessings. Look in verse 7. In whom? We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will. I know God's will. This is the will of Him that sent me, that of all which He hath given me, I should lose nothing and raise it up. At the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me. That everyone that seeth the Son. And believeth on him. Should have everlasting life. Now. He's made known to us. This glorious mystery. Of his will. <clears throat> According to his good pleasure. Which he hath purposed in himself. That in the dispensation. Of the fullness of time. He might gather together in one. All things in Christ. Both which are in heaven. And which are on earth. Even in him. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Now. If you're poor and you know that shortly you're going to inherit millions of dollars, it doesn't bother you too much, does it? My poverty right now, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. Well, I've got an inheritance. I'm a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. And no matter what's going on right now, it's not going to last. 
one of these days I'm going to enter into the fullness of this glorious inheritance. According, verse 11, to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, <clears throat> that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Who first trusted in Christ? God did. He trusted Christ to bring me to himself. In whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. You know when you're saved, you find out God saved you. That's what you find out. You find out God saved you. Now that's God's blessing. <clears throat> after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance into the redemption of the purchased present possession and to the praise of His glory. Now, every believer has all of these spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And these blessings, or this blessing, is not only complete and eternal, it's personal. What do you mean by that? The angel came to Mary and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. That's the same word that's translated made accepted in Ephesians 1.6. And this is true of all of God's people. Thou art highly favored among women. Blessed art thou the Lord is with thee. Now these blessings are not generic. They're to individuals. You see, God doesn't throw out his blessings and it's up for us to take them or reject them. No, if he blesses you, you're blessed. And you have it. And it is personal. Now, I can say to every believer... You are part of His body. You are His bride. And heaven would not be complete without you. Heaven would not be complete without you. Christ is going to have his bride. Husbands, <clears throat> love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might perfect it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, a glorious bride, not having spot or wrinkle or any such Thing. Now, this blessing makes every believer beautiful to Christ. I'm his beautiful bride that he desires. You know, somebody, I always hear this uh, thing of God's love being unconditional. No, it's not unconditional. The reason he loves you is because in Christ, you're altogether lovely to him. He sees no spot in you. He sees no wrinkle. He sees no blemish. He sees you as perfect. I know you don't think of yourself that way. Neither do I. I like what the uh, woman said in the Song of Psalms. I'm black but comely. I'm ugly but beautiful. I'm ugly in myself, but I'm beautiful in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is how every believer really is. What a blessing to be without spot. When God sees you, He sees no iniquity, no sin, only that which is beautiful. Now, <clears throat> how can I know if I've been blessed by God? I want to know, don't you? To be blessed is to have his eternal blessings. It's to have his complete blessings. You don't like any of them. It's yours personally. 
How can I know if I have been blessed of God? Well, turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Verse 9. Galatians chapter 3, verse 9. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it's written, curse it is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, we read in those two verses of they which are of faith and they which are of the works of the law. Now, we have to understand what it means to be of the works of the law and of faith. But if I'm of the works of the law, I'm under God's curse. What is meant by being of the works of the law. Does that mean you're trying to live up to the Ten Commandments and if you fail, you're under the curse? Yeah. Yeah. But it means more than that. To be of the works of the law, turn to Galatians chapter 4. You're already there. <clears throat> Verse 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other of a free woman. This is talking about the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Isaac and Ishmael. It's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he, if the free woman, was by promise, <clears throat> which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, works and grace. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai, the place where the giving of the law was. Now here's the story. God promised Abraham, you're going to have a son. 25 years later, it still hadn't happened. Sarah said, obviously, God's will is not going to come to pass unless we do our part. Here's Hagar, this young Egyptian woman. You go in unto her, and we'll have a son through her. Abraham did that. Abraham did his part. And Ishmael, who is never acknowledged by God as a son, is born. And God says, this is not going to be the heir. You doing your part. Here is grace. Here is faith. You're going to have a son because I said you're going to have a son. That's the only reason. And it's going to be a son who's supernaturally born. Sarah had already gone through menopause. And God miraculously caused her to be with child. Picturing the gospel. Now here's the point. The works of the law is you doing your part to make God's blessing complete. It won't happen unless you do your part. You know, even if you take faith and make faith the cause of salvation, and that's what most people do. Faith, you won't be blessed by God, you won't be saved, you won't be accepted unless you do your part. You need to believe, you need to repent. And if that's not done, you'll end up in hell. You know why it is to salvation by works? That whole way of thinking. It's, it's, it's a contrary to what faith is. You doing your part is law. If any, now listen to me, if any part of your salvation is dependent upon you doing your part or it won't take place, you believe in works. You're of the works of the law and you're, <clears throat> and you're under the curse. Here is an example. Christ died for me. God wants me to save, to be saved. But I won't be unless I believe. You're of the works of the law. I can become more holy, more 
pleasing to God, more sanctified by my works. You're under the works of the law. Well, I can at least earn a higher reward in heaven by my works. You're of the works of the law. And as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now, is that clear? If any aspect, I don't care what it is, if any part of your salvation is dependent upon you, you're of the works of the law and you're under the curse. Those who are of faith are those who are 100% relying on Jesus Christ alone. Paul put it this way in 2 Timothy 1.12. I know I uh, quote this a lot, and I don't make any apologize. No apologies for that. 2 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed. Not what, but whom. And what you believe is dependent upon who you believe. I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've... Anybody know the next word? Committed. Committed. To him against that day. What would you commit Paul? Everything. My salvation. Is completely dependent. Upon this. When he said. It is finished. I was saved. That's faith. It's a complete reliance. On who. He is, and what He did, as everything in your salvation, and you don't have anything else. All you have is who He is, and what He did only. You wouldn't dare add anything to it. That is being of faith. And everybody who is of faith has all of God's Blessing. I'm not looking to my works in any measure to any degree. I'm like David. David on his dying bed said, Although my house be not so with God, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure. And the reason it's sure is because of the blood of this everlasting covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what makes it sure. And David said, This is all my salvation. And all my desire, though he make it not to grow. That's faith. You look to Christ only. You don't look to your works. You don't look to your evidences. You don't look to your experience. All you have is Jesus Christ. That person has the blessing. One last scripture, Acts chapter 3. Verse 26. This is the last point. It's not actually the last scripture. It's not going to take long, so stay with me. I know it's hot in here. I'm watching everybody. But uh, stay awake. Acts chapter 3, verse 26. Unto you first, God having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you in turning away every one of you from His Iniquities. Now here is God's blessing when He turns you. When He turns you. Don't you want to be turned by the Lord? I want to be turned by the Lord. I want to be turned from mine iniquities to Him. Turn with me to Jeremiah 31. I want to show you a couple of scriptures with regard to this thing of being turned. You remember Psalm 80, uh, turn us again, O Lord, cause thy face to shine and we'll be, shed, we'll be saved. But look at this passage in Psalm 31, verse 18. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. Jeremiah, did I say something? Uh, Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 18. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastised me. And I was chastised as a bullock accustomed, unaccustomed to the yoke. 
I was chastised, it didn't do me any good. I stayed the same, is what he's saying. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned. For thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after I was instructed, I smote my thigh, I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Now Jeremiah says, turn me. Can't you turn yourself? No. No. Well, you ought to. I know I ought to, but I can't. Didn't the Lord say, without me, you can do no thing? Nothing. You're trying to find an excuse for sin. No, I'm not. I'm trying to find deliverance from sin. Turn me. Turn me. This is part of God's blessings, being turned. Turn with me to Psalm 119. This is the last scripture we'll look at. Psalm 119. Blessed, verse 1, Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep His testimonies that seek Him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in His way. Thou hast commanded us to keep Thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Look in verse 33 of this same chapter. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it into the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I'll observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. Cause me to turn me and force me to, is what he's asking. For therein do I delight Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Can you see how he's asking the Lord to turn him? Make my heart to be inclined to thy testimonies. Verse 37, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach which I fear for thy judgments are good. Behold, I've longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Now in every one of these verses of Scripture, David is saying, turn me. Turn me. Now, if you've been blessed of God, I know this, you're going to ask Him to turn you. You're going to, this is going to be, this is going to be your way of thinking. Lord, turn me. Don't let me go in the way that I would go. Turn me. Blessed of God, he lifted his hands up and blessed them. His blessings are eternal. They're complete. All spiritual blessings. They're personal. The evidence is faith. Being a faith and not of the works of the law. That means you look to Christ only. You don't look anywhere else. And when you have faith, this is going to be your continual prayer. Turn me. And I will be turned. Turn me to thyself. Turn me to thy son. May God enable us to pray that prayer so that we will look to Christ only. This is his blessing. And like old Jacob, I, I love to think of Jacob. Jacob was a sinful man. He was a weak man. He was a deceitful man. We could go on and on talking about all the trouble he got himself into because of the way he was. Yet God is called the God of Jacob. And when Christ wrestles with Jacob and he brings him down, Jacob didn't wrestle with him. Christ wrestled with him. He's the one who initiated this. And he brought him down and put his hip out of joint. And he walked with a limp, the scripture says, for the rest of his life. And if you ever come into contact with the God of Jacob, you're going to realize you walk with a limp. But what was Jacob's words? I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. May that be my prayer and your prayer. Let's pray.
Lord, how we desire your blessing, your favor. And Lord, put it in our heart. Lord, we won't have this prayer. I will not let thee go except thou bless me unless you put it in our heart. We ask that you would put in our heart, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Oh, Lord, how we need your blessing. And Lord, we know by your word that all who need thy blessing have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Lord, take this word and bless it for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dwayne, come, Lisa, and